千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware. As we all ready ourselves for this sacred process of the Tao. So, as usual, every chapter has a title, chapter title in Chinese. This particular one, Huai Yu Zhang, this is the Hold Jade Within chapter. So the name comes from the very last line of this chapter, and it is metaphoric about holding the Tao within. So jade in this case is not a literal piece of jade, but the precious Tao. Jade itself, the character, has often been used. Throughout Chinese literature, to indicate something that is of great value, so in this case, it is being used to represent the Tao itself. But I must caution everyone that in other uses of jade in the Tao Te Ching, it isn't always used the same way. And indeed, later on in, in this chapter, when we get to the appropriate point. I'll highlight some of the differences that the character is used. For now, let's take a look at the chapter itself. So, not a very long chapter at all. A total of nine lines, as you can see. And chapter seventy says, "My words are easy to understand, easy to practice." The world cannot understand, cannot practice. My words have basis. My actions have principle. People do not understand this. Therefore, they do not understand me. Those who understand me are few. Thus, I am highly valued. Therefore, the sage wears plain clothes but holds jade. So the very last part of it that you just heard, you can tell that's where the chapter title comes from. Now this chapter, I think you can see just looking at it without any discussion, you can tell that it's basically the words of Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu addressing his readers. Lao Tzu talking to you and me across the span of centuries, and his message is interesting. He is basically saying that although my words are easy to understand, well, I'm actually not understood. Despite the words being easy, I am misunderstood. So the reason for why that is is going to make for a discussion. Uh, in our talk today, he then goes on to say, "My words, my actions, they're based in the Tao. We'll talk about that, and that that is what people don't understand. And then we'll dig even a little deeper there to discover the underlying reasons why there is misunderstanding. And then in the very last line, he talks about wearing plain clothes but holds jade." That's metaphoric language, highly specific about、uh, a major concept in the Tao. So for now, what we do, as usual, is that we're going to be looking at the original Chinese, the corresponding translation, 
And then we'll be able to use that to pick out the subtle section divisions within this chapter. So every chapter is like that. There are sections within, sometimes several sections, three sections, four sections, or more. There is no set rule, but every single chapter divides itself into multiple sections, and sometimes it's simplistic, like there's a beginning section, there's the main body, the middle section, and then there's a concluding section. So let's take a look at what this one looks like. The way we do it is that we look to the original Chinese, that's the column to the left, and then we see if we can spot similar characters from one line to the next. That's actually easy to do when it comes to lines one and two. You can spot that, for instance, the last characters of both lines are the same. Each line is divided into two parts of five characters and three characters each, and the last character of the first five characters, so the fifth character there, well, that is the same from line one to line two. Now there's more repetition and within the line. So for instance, in line one, you're gonna be able to look horizontally and you're gonna be able to see that the third and fourth characters are the same as the first two characters of the second part. And then, it's the same pattern for line two. Now, if all of that is confusing, let me go ahead and highlight it for you right now so you can see for yourself. So up and down vertically, you can see the corresponding characters. The last character there is the most obvious. And then in the middle, there's a character that's repeating from line one to line two. Then you can also see even without being able to read Chinese, you can see the same characters in the first part to the second part of that line. Now, to the right-hand side, you're going to be able to see the translation of that. So first of all, the repeating characters from top to bottom, from line one to line two, you're going to see the repeating words in English. So the very last character there is translated as practice. So the actual character, as we're going to talk about in just a moment, it's basically to go somewhere, to travel somewhere, to walk someplace. But it's got that additional meaning to practice, to put something into practice. So when in English we say go, sometimes we say go do something. So that is a similar context here. Then the repeating middle character there, you can see the repeating English word, understand. Understand is repeated from line one to line two, and that's translating that particular character. That character means to know or to understand. So then the repeating characters horizontally well, in the English, you see the word easy, easy to, easy to understand, easy to practice. That's a reiteration within the line. And you can see that same pattern in the Chinese characters to the left. Then in line two, you can see cannot is repeated within the line, cannot understand, cannot practice. And that's what's being repeated in the Chinese as well. So these two lines are distinctive, and you can tell that they belong together, they form a couplet. The lines below that, from line three onward, we've got two lines of three characters each. So they are quite different from the first two lines. Line three and line four seem to belong together, and line one and line two seem to belong together. Therefore, we have identified the introductory section. So the intro for this particular chapter is basically Lao Tzu saying that, hey, listen, my words are easy to understand, but the, wor but the world at large cannot understand, cannot understand my words. So now we can take a look at the 
section below to see how far it goes. Now, as I mentioned, line three and line four, they seem to belong together. They've got two repeating characters, uh, the middle character in line three and the middle character in line four, as you can see. And that character is translated as have, as in to possess something, to have something. Then, would that make it, would that make the two lines a section by themselves? Well, we need to double check. We need to take a look at the meaning to see if Laozi switches to a different thought. So checking just the English for now, Laozi says, my words have basis, my actions are principle. Okay, that's great. Then he says, people do not understand this, therefore they do not understand me. So now you see from line three down to line six, that's actually a complete thought. That's a thought by itself. And we can see that being reflected in the characters uh, being repeated. So the very last character of line five is actually the same as the last character of line six. In case that's hard to see, let me just go ahead and highlight that for everybody. Alrighty. So we can bring in a division here. So let's take a look. You've got the character yo translated as half and that's line three and line four then you've got the character zhi translated as understand and that's line five and line six and note that the character translated as understand that's exactly the same character translated as understand in line one and line two so here it's an elaboration of the introductory section Introductory section already says from Laozi, Laozi that Laozi says, my words are easy to understand, but the world cannot understand. And then he elaborates on that in the middle section, the main section saying that, well, my words have basis, my actions are principle, but that is what people do not understand. And that is why they do not understand me. And finally, the last three lines, they form a concluding section. So if you take a look at line seven and line eight, you've got a couple of repeating characters in the middle. And those characters, uh, specifically I wanna point out the second character in line seven and the second character in line eight. Those are the characters for I, me, myself, and I. And therefore, this is Lao Tzu talking about himself. So the character for I is similar in meaning to the very first character of line one. Now they look different, but the first character of line one is also me, myself, and I. The meaning is the same, even though the characters are different. The difference is, the first character of line one is the more formal ancient way to say I or me, whereas the character war from seven and eight, the second character correspondingly, those are the modern way to say the same thing. Last time I talk about I talked about the difference between you, the English word you versus the older English words, thou and thee, they all mean the same thing. They all mean you. It's just that thou and thee are the more formal and the older way of saying the same thing. So it's the same situation here. So let me go ahead and highlight those characters so you can see the translation. And you can tell there that one of them is translated as me and then the other one is translated as I am it's all contextual. It depends on the way that it is used in a sentence. That's how we would find the correct translation in English. So take a look at the chapter as a whole. We've got something here that can potentially be puzzling. Like my words are easy to understand, but the world cannot understand. Well, how come? How do we make sense of that? 
So I've, I want to pose some questions for everyone that are inspired by the chapter we just read. Question number one is, why do people not understand Lao Tzu? Well, the chapter itself provides some answers, but it turns out that we can go even a little deeper on that. Specifically, we can ask a, another way to frame the question. What makes Lao Tzu so different you know, from other people, from most people, that he is hard for them to understand? And then the other question is, he says that those who understand me are few. So I want to dig a little deeper into that. Who are the people who are the few people that actually understand him and therefore the Tao? Then challenge for all of us, question for everybody. Are we among them? Are we part of that group? Are we the few, the proud, the Tao cultivators? Can we count ourselves among the few who actually understand Lao Tzu and the Tao? And let me say this, the majority of people in the West who study the Tao, because of the amount of misinformation they consume, the poor or low quality translation that they absorb, a lot of them cannot be counted on as being among the few who actually understand the Tao. Now, obviously, I would like us to be the exception to that. I would like for all of us to be among the few that actually understand the Tao. And I also want to ask the question, how few are they exactly? And you may be wondering, uh, well, how can we know that? Well, I will explain when we get to the appropriate place that elsewhere in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu talks about the same thing. And there we can glean some ideas about how few exactly they, they are among the people who understand the Tao. So I think interesting questions for us to ponder and explore together, and they reveal themselves as we examine these lines one by one. So now let's take a look at line one. Line one says, my words are easy to understand, easy to practice. Well, take a look at just the first part of it. Okay, Lao Tzu explicitly states is easy. His words are easy to understand. He's basically saying that, hey, look, everybody, I express myself plainly. He's basically saying, I do not go deeply into esoteric concepts that can potentially be confusing to everyone. He's saying, my goal is to be clear, direct, and to the point, not trying to confuse anybody. So in fact, this statement here, this is one of the ways that we know that Tao Te Ching is not supposed to be cryptic, not meant to be cryptic. Now, of course, in modern times, reading ancient text written 2,500 years ago, linguistic differences alone will make the passage less easy, uh, not as easy to understand. It's the same challenge that we have reading Shakespeare in the original. Time has passed. Linguistic usage has changed. Some words are no longer used. Some words are no longer used in the same way. And therefore, that introduces the feeling that it's uh, cryptic but it was not meant to be at the time that it was written. That's the point. So generally speaking, overall, Tao sages throughout history have always been plain spoken. Actual sages from history, what they do, they simplify and clarify. That is what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to simplify and clarify. They're not supposed to mystify. And because of that, what we note 
is that actual sages from history, unlike stereotypical media de uh, depictions thereof, they do not speak in riddles, they do not complicate things. So this is the reason why Dao cultivators all seek to do the same thing, that is communicate directly, to be plain spoken with everybody, to be open, to be candid. Now, here's one problem that we see that we have in the West. In the West, we often see the very opposite of what I just said. There are still people who think the Tao Te Ching is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. We have people who complicate things and they do that in a, in a number of ways and they're helped by the language barrier. So I'll talk about that in a moment. For now, I want to get to the second part of this line. So Lao Tzu just got done talking about how his words are easy to understand, and then you can see in the translation, the second part is that not only are they easy to understand, but they're also easy to put into daily practice, actual practice. So that's what I want to focus on next. So I want to highlight the very last character there. It means to go, to go someplace, to travel someplace, to walk someplace. In this context, it means to do. Now, I mentioned that in English, we say to go do something. That's related, but we even have a closer analog to that. We, in modern times, have this familiar expression that you should not just talk the talk, you should walk the walk. And sometimes we say, you should walk the talk. And sometimes we say, you should practice what you preach. So now, walk is in the same position as practice, and talk is in the same position as preach. That's the context. So to go someplace linguistically can be linked to do something. So Lao Tzu is saying that his teachings are not difficult to apply, to apply to life. And this is because the Tao itself is practical. The perspective is practical. It is supposed to be applicable to everyday life. Now, when I first started studying the Tao here in the West, I definitely saw that this was not the case I saw that many people, rather than to apply the Tao to everyday life, they studied it as a philosophical thing that sort of like a mental toy. These concepts to toy with mentally, to talk about with other people, but rarely apply to life. And I noted in, from the beginning that this was definitely the wrong way to go. This is definitely not the way that the Tao is practiced in Asia. So moving on, let's talk about line two as well. As you can see, line two says, the world cannot understand, cannot practice. Let's take a closer look. And when we talk about practice, I want to be very clear with everyone that all the things that we have talked about before, prior to this point in time, they are all meant to be put into practice in everyday life. In chapter 67, remember, we talked about the military saying, uh, which seemed to be about military strategy, but was actually advice on life strategy. The military saying back in chapter 69 said, I prefer to withdraw a foot more so than to advance an inch. And then there's also the discussion about being the host and being the guest. The overall concept, the message is the same. And that is, I would rather back away courteously, be ready for changing situations, rather to advance and impose myself on other people in an aggressive way. I would prefer to not be the attacker, but be the defender in social interactions. I would prefer to be the one who lets other people go first. So we're serious about that as Dao cultivators. 
to apply that to life means a whole bunch of different things. It means being courteous in every aspect of it, as I mentioned, but in practical reality, note that it also means that we want to avoid, as an example, the common practice of cutting people off mid-sentence. That's rude. It is aggressive. From the gentle perspective, the soft touch, the light touch of the Dow cultivator, the preference is to give the other person plenty of room to finish saying what they want to say, not cut them off. I do understand that things can get heated sometimes, and perhaps they are cutting you off all the time. My advice, and I know that it's difficult advice to put into practice, my advice is to maintain your cool, your composure in a situation like that, maintain control. He who has calmness and control has the upper hand when things get heated. And this is something that I need to remind myself as well. It is something that can be easily forgotten in a heated moment. So speaking of knowing and practicing and inability to know, inability to practice, let's talk about light too. The world cannot understand, cannot practice. So the question, as I mentioned, is this one. If the Tao is supposed to be simple, why do so many not know it? And you know, and I know, especially here in the West, sometimes we do see the Tao presented as mysterious or unknowable. And having seen this for the past couple of decades, my humble opinion is that this may very well be an aspect of human nature. And if so, then it's something that hasn't changed much since the days of Lao Tzu. What I mean by that, by human nature, is that, well, some people seem to have a vested interest in making things more complex. They make things more complicated, more difficult to understand is to basically elevate themselves in a higher position, like this is compli too complicated for you. It is something that I understand, but you may not be able to understand it. It is usually ego driven to make oneself appear authoritative or wise. And there are all kinds of variations of this. Basically, to make things more complicated, one thing you can do is to introduce uncertainty, to talk about variations, to talk about not being sure about what is right or wrong. So remember, there are people who try to put on an air of higher wisdom by saying, who's right, who's wrong, who knows? Or they will say, the more I learn, the less I know. And now I see that I don't know anything. This appears to be self-deprecating humor, but in reality, it is another way to assert one's ego. So I hope that you never catch me saying a joke like that, like an underhanded way to express one's ego that would not be fitting well with one's practice in the virtue of humility. So furthermore, let me provide some additional examples. This is something that we see quite often, especially in the study of the Tao. I want to ask everyone to watch out for the following. There are people who study and or teach the Tao that talk about how, well, you know, there are so many different versions of the Tao Te Ching, which one do you use? And they will then talk about the version that they use, showing off knowledge. They can talk, for instance, about an, uh, the oldest version known of the Tao Te Ching, and there are, there's actually several. Uh, and they, these older versions were um, unearthed by archaeologists from ancient tombs. And they go back to within just one or 200 years of the time of Lao Tzu. 
And so examples include He Shang Gong, Ma Wang Dui. These were all ancient tombs where copies of very old, very ancient Dao De Jing have been uncovered. So these were the multiple versions that are often cited. Now, the idea, remember, is to assert the ego by introducing complexity and uncertainty, which is the one to use. Now, let me first explain why there were multiple versions to begin with. Back in the days of Laozi, 2,500 years ago, this was before the invention of paper. So writing medium was not easy to come by. So sometimes people wrote in silk, sheets of silk, obviously much more expensive to produce than the paper that would later be invented. Sometimes people would cut bamboo strips and then tie them together to form a writing surface. So writing surfaces being rare and relatively expensive, people had to be very careful in abbreviating what they want to express. And this contributes to, to the overall brevity of the Tao Te Ching itself. The other factor is that there was no printing press. Obviously not, there wasn't even paper. With the lack of automated printing press, everything had to be copied by hand. When people copy things by hand, you often end up with inaccurate, distorted, or incomplete results. This was the case for the Ma Wang Dui manuscript. And that is what introduces multiple variations. Even when you copy from an, an authoritative version, you could end up with mistakes in yours. And you could copy it out of order. You could copy the last chapter first, the first chapter last, etc. You could mix it up. The other great factor is that when people saw the hand copied versions of the Tao Te Ching back in those days, if they were Tao sages themselves, they would instantly understand what Lao Tzu was trying to accomplish. Lao Tzu was trying to compile this compendium, this summary that summarized the existing wisdom that was known up until that point in time. So when they saw that, and they themselves having studied the ancient Tao as well, they would add things that they knew about, but that Lao Tzu perhaps did not know about. This also introduced additional variations. Now, the multiple variations were eventually unified, and this was about 700 years after, seven or 800 years after the time of Lao Tzu. They were all standardized, and there was a scholar, a young scholar, who had access to all these different versions of the Tao Te Ching. So with access to these ancient versions, which we no longer have, he could see where the changes were made, where the variations took place, and he could consolidate them. He could, for instance, weed out mistakes. So this was eventually known as the Wang Bi version. And that version, the standardized version, has been in use for well over 1700 years. That's the version that most people would standardize on, and rightfully so. And it is possible Wang Bi is very close to He Shang Gong, so those two versions could be used together. Whereas the Ma Wang Dui version, the one from this tomb belonging to uh, a noble, well, that one appeared to be a practice copy of the actual, original, authentic Tao Te Ching. And therefore, it should not supplant the effort of later scholars who unify the versions into the correct version. Anyhow, the, um, the bottom line for all of us is that we just have to know that the, it's actually quite simple we just have one unified standard version now. There's still going to be, uh, human beings are imperfect. So when we transmit or copy or study these versions, there may be a few characters off here and there. 
you know, I see that myself, but there's always an accurate version that is 99% the same as other accurate versions. That's what we can work from. So it doesn't have to be complicated. So beware of people who try to make it complicated when it doesn't have to be. Second, there are also people, people who teach, people who study, who will talk about, oh, well, you know, every single line of the Tao Te Ching has numerous interpretations. That is actually false. Let me explain why that is a mistaken statement. Throughout the entire Tao Te Ching, the vast majority of the lines, the meaning is clear. The meaning is specific. It's been explained since ancient times in countless commentary volumes. Countless scholars came and went and put in their own notations on what an original line actually meant. So for the majority of them, there's widespread consensus on what they mean. Pretty much, it's not controversial at all. There are a few lines that can be interpreted in maybe two ways or three ways, but most of the lines have one valid interpretation that is agreed upon for centuries. This is why I say not all interpretations are equally valid. The vast majority of the freewheeling interpretations we see in the West are actually wrong. The majority of them are actually distorted or misunderstood. And let me use an example to explain what I mean by uh, most lines have agreed upon interpretations. If you think about the Bible, the Christian Bible, well, it's from ancient times. It's been, it's gone through many versions. There are many, many versions of it still. And there are numerous interpretations, but for most of the Bible, it's the meaning of the lines are not controversial. If you were to uh, study Sermon on the Mount, you're going to see that most people, most Christian scholars would readily agree upon the meaning and the message that comes from Sermon on the Mount. Okay, It's not controversial. There aren't, you know, a hundred interpretations of that. The meaning is pretty clear. It's like that with the Tao Te Ching. And then number three, there are also people who say this. Well, you know, every Chinese character has multiple definitions. So what they're trying to say is that, look at how many versions of Tao Te Ching there are, look at how many interpretations per line there are, look at how many definitions per character there are, and therefore, altogether, the complexity multiplies until you have basically an infinite number of possible interpretations of the Tao Te Ching. And again, I'm going to have to say no, no, and no, or false, false, and false. Look at this claim here for just a moment. In the image that I have in this slide to the lower right-hand side, that is just a snapshot of one page from a Chinese dictionary. It's similar as an English dictionary, except that, of course, it's all in Chinese. And yes, many Chinese characters have multiple definitions, but I could say the exact same thing for English words. Many English words have multiple definitions. Look in any English dictionary and you will see that. This aspect of the Chinese language is no different from English or any other language. Many, but not all words have multiple definitions. Some have just a limited uh, definitions. Some words have only one definition. Now, despite the fact that we have many words with multiple definitions, I want to note that we are now conversing in English. We manage to communicate every day using the English language, clearly getting the message across most of the time, being understood, despite the fact that many words have multiple definitions. The trouble that we get 
in language in general, English or otherwise, is the game of telephone. When one person conveys the same message to another person, it's not from multiple definitions of words. Now, of course, sometimes we can be confused by the multiple definitions. Sometimes we creatively will use that as a pun or make a joke out of it. But in that regard, it's just like any other language. Chinese is no different. Lastly, let me just point out the dictionaries, the Chinese dictionaries that we have, they're no larger or more complex than English dictionaries. Languages of the world serve a particular need, and that is communication. They are complex enough to convey nuance of meaning, but that's it. They are no more complicated than they need to be. Same with Chinese, just another language. All right, so lastly, just to finish off this slide, I also want to talk about people who study or teach the Tao in the West will sometimes talk about feelings, using feelings as a judge. Like, okay, well, you know, Derek, I hear what you're saying. I understand everything that you say has basis in reality. Uh, you study this stuff, you can read the original. Okay, great, but I feel like this interpretation is accurate. I feel like this meaning is, this is what appeals to me. This is what strikes me as true. Well, let me say this. Regardless of our feelings about certain lines, the original meaning that has been agreed upon for centuries, that doesn't change regardless of personal feelings. There is, in language, right and wrong, intended, unintended, beyond the feelings of the person who hears the message. Now, it's the same in all human communication. Think about the red light and green light that we have in traffic stops. I can feel differently about them. It doesn't change the agreed upon meaning that red light means stop, green light means go. We agree on that for most of us so civilization can function. And if you think about it too, I can say, I can make a case for red being a positive thing. I can say, well, note how in Chinese culture, red is the color of celebration. It is the color of life because it is the color of blood. So a reddish um, hue is a very good thing. And therefore, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I look at the red lights and say, that means go, signals are go. I'll let that represent the signal to go. Well, I'm making a case for it. I have feelings about it. It doesn't change what has been agreed upon by most people so civilization can function. So my final message is that when you encounter people like that, you know, oftentimes they will be overusing a lot of jargon. They will use jargon without explanation just to be able to sort of uh, project an area of superiority Look at all these terms I know uh, that are not known to the public. When you see anyone like that, anyone talking about these three points here, I would say, again, beware. This is an example of somebody complicating the Tao that was meant to be simple. We are now in the last part of line two that the part that says cannot practice. So here's my comments on that. I would say that in this world, we do not often see Tao-centered actions, uh, even though, according to Laozi, they are easy. They are easy to do. They are easy to follow. So here's what I would say. Yes, um, people oftentimes do not know what the Tao is. And what that means is that it's, it's a recipe for inaction or mistaken action because people cannot apply what they don't understand. Now, sometimes I would say that people do have an intuitive understanding of what is natural or right 
or the best way to go. So in, in which case, they can be doing the right thing without knowing about the Tao concepts or the Tao principles behind their actions. More often than not, though, in this world of ours, we see people acting in ways that are not necessarily beneficial to others or to themselves, that they cause more negativity than, than positive. And then I would also say that those who misunderstand the Tao, that can totally lead to the incorrect path. Now, and I myself have seen numerous misinterpretations of the Tao that lead people down the wrong path. The path, for instance, of inaction, the path of random whim-driven actions, like when people say, well, I'm just going to go wherever the day takes me, like combining that with a shrug. And why do they do that? One is because, you know, I study the Tao, I go with the flow. Uh, I just, uh, I'm just, you know, wandering you know, in a carefree heart, with a carefree heart, and I'm just going to end up someplace. Who knows where that's going to be, but I will be there and I will be happy. Anyhow, these are numerous uh, incorrect paths that people follow that don't end up with great results in life. And I'll talk about that momentarily. And even when people know the Tao, sometimes there's a gap between knowing and doing. This is like, you know, when we talk about how uh, your teacher can show you the door, uh, like which door to take, which path to take, but you're the one who has, you're, you're ultimately, you are the person who has to open the door or walk down the path that has been identified by the teacher. So that's the gap between knowing and doing. Just knowing which way to go, that's actually not enough. You have to actually go there. You have to actually do the thing that you know you should do. So continue on. Let's take a look at line three. Line three, this is where Lao Tzu talks about my words have basis, my actions have principle. So I want to start with the last character of line three. Zhong, and the pinyin, I think, can lead to the mistaken pronunciation of Zhang, like Bang, you know, a Bang hit, um, or King Kong, but it's not Zhang, it's Zhong. The meaning of this character is ancestor, source, foundation, basis. These are all related in meaning because your ancestor is the source uh, from whence you came. The biological basis and foundation of your physical being, your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your ancestors before that. So these are all related. So what is the basis for what Lao Tzu talks about? What is the basis for the Tao? The basis of Tao concepts is observations of nature. The ancient sages looked at the world. They looked at heaven and earth. They looked at the changing of seasons. They looked at the animals. Uh, they looked at plants, weather, etc. From observations of nature, they could derive a whole bunch of Tao concepts. Then they turn their attention to human beings. So the basis of Tao teachings is the observation of human lives. Who among us gets better results, lasting results, lasting goodness? Well, what they do must be in accordance with the Tao. We can figure out what the Tao is by figuring out what it is that they do correctly. If someone is getting fantastic results in life and, you know, is amply rewarded, then we want to know what are the positive things they do that led up to that. And what about the people who resort to violence, who ultimately fail, who ultimately suffer violence themselves, 
Well, there's a lesson there that we can learn from observation as well. We observe people who are rigid, dogmatic, inflexible, how they fail at what they try, what they're trying to do because they encounter an obstacle and then they lack the flexibility to figure out what to do beyond that. In nature, we see, for instance, how water flows to the lowest place. So the Tao concept of humility comes from that observation. Water flowing to the lowest place and a whole bunch of other ideas in the Tao come from that observation of water as well. We'll talk about those. So let's uh, combine all three characters in line three together. My words have basis. So here's Lao Tzu basically asserting that he's saying what I'm talking about, these are not from theoretical ideas. These are not theories. These are actual. These are from life. These are life wisdom that's being offered to you. And his teachings are based on practical everyday reality. This is what works. This is what actually works for people. These teachings must be tested and proven, or if they're not proven, cannot be proven, they must be discarded. If they don't pass the test of actual utilization, they must be discarded. We're on the wrong idea. We must discard that idea and come up with a better idea. Now, in my humble opinion, this practical aspect of the Tao is the reason why the Tao Te Ching has remained popular for 2,500 years. It works. And this is also why I talk about how we can oftentimes detect distortions of the Tao. When the distortion results in a practice that is impractical, that doesn't get great results, then I can tell there is a distortion someplace. I mentioned carefree wandering a few slides back. That is a concept from the Tao. The mistaken idea is that people will sometimes imagine that carefree wandering means a random approach of just going wherever. In reality, when we talk about carefree wandering, we're not talking about random wandering. We're talking about carefree as being relaxed, that you can wander with a relaxed, carefree mindset. And how do you become truly relaxed wandering around? Well, when you have clarity on where you want to go and how to get there, that's when you can truly be relaxed because you know you're on your way. That's the meaning. If you have done a moderate amount of planning to cover contingencies, you can relax because you are prepared. You are ready. There's no need to worry. So carefree wondering is mistaken as some sort of a random approach. It is not. The unplanned spontaneous action that sometimes people talk about as being sort of a mainstay of Tao teaching, it's actually not. Tao teaching is advocating a combination of the planned approach with spontaneous improvisation, that there should be an element of the static and the dynamic. Combine them skillfully, you've got a great plan. And then let's take a look at line four. Jun, let me bring out the opinion for that. When you look at that, you might say June, like the month, or Jun, based on the way that it's spelled, but it's actually Jun. It's a little tricky to sound out for a native English speaker. Jun, what it means is a ruler, a ruling centralizing principle. It's like the central nexus of one's decision-making that is what provides the ruling power. 
So that's what that is, the central principle. The actions of a sage are governed by Tao principles. So that is what they do. That is how they live their lives. And what they see, the reason why they follow the Tao, obey the dictates of the Tao, is because the Tao provides direction, destination, and milestones along the way. Most importantly, I think for most people, what the Tao can provide to them is a direction in life. What happens when people are missing that element? What happens when people don't have a direction in life? They feel empty. There's no meaning. There's no purpose to what they do. They're not sure where they're going, and they're seeking the answer. The Tao can help provide that. The ultimate destination of your life's journey, the milestones along the way. What can you expect when you get to a certain point? Now, that is the important point. The point of doing something is the point. In the Tao, there's always a point. There's always a reason, a purpose, a meaning to the actions that we take. Once you understand Tao principles, that's it. It provides that framework for you to follow. And this is why for the sages, once they understand the principle, once they follow that framework, they do not compromise on it. And how do we know that the Tao provides direction, destination, and milestones along the way? Well, after all, the character Tao means the path or the way. Literally, it's directions. Literally, it's a map of getting you to where you want to go. Now, let's go ahead and bring all three characters together in line four. My actions have principle. Tao sages follow specific principles in their work. And as I mentioned, these principles are derived from observation. So here's an example. They look around in human society. They observe people leading different lives. They can see, based on observation, that random actions are ineffective. Random actions, by definition, is going off in random directions, not necessarily the direction that you want. And that makes them ineffective. So when people have that realization, that a random approach is not going to get you anywhere, they can sometimes overcorrect. That is, they can go the extreme other direction to have a plan that is inflexible. That also doesn't work. So being random is an extreme. Being inflexible is the other extreme. If someone has a plan that is sort of like set in stone that permits no other possibilities, well, they can oftentimes encounter an obstacle and then they cannot get around the obstacle, therefore leading to failure. So having observed these two things, randomness doesn't work, rigidity doesn't work, Tao sages would apply the principle of moderation and then use an approach that's between the two extremes. The approach, as I mentioned, that combines the set elements with the dynamic um, improvisation as the moment dictates. So much of this is derived from observation of nature as well. So let me provide an example for everyone. In this slide, I have the image of a mountain stream at the bottom. Then I have two columns, one column for water, observations of water, and how that can apply to human beings. So for instance, sages would observe that water does not flow randomly. It follows the laws of nature. It flows to a particular point. It does a particular thing. It is 
not random. So if we were to emulate that, if we were to emulate Tao, emulate nature, then we human beings, we too should act with deliberate intent, following the principles of the Tao. Just as water follows the laws of nature, we should also act from principles of the Tao. Now, water flows downhill according to the contours of terrain. It doesn't just flow anywhere. There's a specific way that it'll flow, and it depends on the contours of the terrain. In a similar way, we human beings, each one of us has a, a specific, unique, personal, individual goals. What you want to accomplish may be very different from what I want to accomplish for myself. So we move toward that. And what that is, is up to the individual. It's unique to you. So individual goals, whatever they may be, this is now we're talking about, as we uh, mentioned in the last slide, we talk, we're talking about the direction, we're talking about the milestones, the destination, etc. Just by looking at nature, we can derive more on what nature demonstrates to us and what we see in human lives. In nature, we sometimes see stagnant pools of water. I've seen it, you've seen it, everyone has seen it. A person who does not have a direction in life is like that stagnant pool of water. Stagnant pool of water, that water is not going anywhere. Somebody who doesn't have direction in life, he, he or she is not going anywhere. Soon, the water becomes stale. The stagnant water becomes stale. It becomes breeding ground for parasites, mold, and bacteria. When mosquitoes breed in this dirty water, they carry diseases. They become a health hazard. So think about the toxic effects of being a stagnant pool of water in life. When you don't have a direction, things don't just remain static, they actually become worse. So that is a Tao principle that we can derive just from the observation of nature. Now, what happens when the water is blocked? Observing nature, we see that when blocked, water doesn't waste any time complaining about the blockage. It doesn't waste any time trying to smash the blockage. Perhaps it's a rock that's blocking its way. Water's not going to complain about that. Water's not going to try to smash it. Instead, water is simply going to find whatever path it can around the obstacle. So when blocked, same thing. When we're blocked in life, when we encounter an obstacle preventing us from doing something that we want to accomplish, just like water, we can learn from that. No need for us to complain. No need to get mad, get angry. Obstacles occur in life. That is something that we know for sure, just as water in a mountain stream at some point is going to be blocked. At some point, it's going to have to flow around. Trying to smash through would simply be a waste of energy. Complaining would simply be a waste of time. Instead, water finds a way to get around quickly and efficiently. Can we do the same thing? Well, if we look around, when we get when we encounter an obstacle, if we keep an open mind, there's always another way. There's always another approach. If we keep our eyes open from the open mind, we'll be able to see the solution to the problem. If we're just busy complaining or getting mad, we may not see the solution or the alternative, alternative path at all. So this is where in the Tao, the message from the sages will be, okay, everybody, be like water. 
emulate water. And when I say be like water, it may be reminding you of a famous quote from Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee famously said, be water, my friend. That became so well known, it's actually the title of a book written by his daughter to talk about his philosophy for life. Where do you suppose Bruce Lee got his inspiration, his direction in life from? He got it from studying the Tao. The more familiar with Tao teachings, the more you will see the echo of Tao teachings from Bruce Lee's life philosophy. So quite a few books have actually been written about that. And by the way, what was Bruce Lee's favorite Tao Te Ching translation? Would anyone happen to know? That's actually a trick question. Bruce Lee did not use a translation. He migrated in his late teens to the United States. So he's a native speaker of Chinese. He can simply read the original, which is exactly how I learn as well. No need for a favorite translation when you can just look at the original text. When I say it like that, I think it makes perfect sense to everybody. So be water, my friends. So I want to depict what we just talked about in text format graphically. If you look at this slide, it's actually going to be talking about the same thing except everything is going to be depicted in graphics, which my understanding is that for many people, picture is worth a thousand words. It's actually easier to see it depicted this way so that you can grasp at a single glance. So we start out in this graph on the left-hand side with something that needs to be done, something that you want to do, whatever that is. This can be this can be widely applicable. It could be a, a big project. It could be a task. It could be an errand that you need to run, something you want to do for yourself, something you want to get, whatever that is. It's something that needs to be done. So then we talked about the random approach. So this is where you don't have a plan and you're not sure what to do. The random approach means you try random things. You throw enough stuff on the wall and hope that something sticks. Hope for the best. Something's gonna work, right? Maybe I'll get lucky. Well, I think you have all seen in life, actual examples in life, including our own personal experience, that it doesn't work. The random approach hardly ever works. It leads to failure for the vast majority of the times. Now, we talked about how some people can overcorrect from the random approach to an approach that's not random, but very rigid, very inflexible. And that's the second path here. Instead of lacking a plan, you've got a, a plan full of rigidity, exact steps, and a complete lack of flexibility. You must do things X, Y, Z. You must not vary from the plan. And you can easily imagine what will happen is that you're going to run into an obstacle, one or more obstacles, and you lack the flexibility to work around those obstacles. So the obstacle stops you cold. This leads to frustration, failure as well. So learning from the two unsuccessful paths, we then formulate the better approach based on Tao principle of moderation. We want to have a plan that is not too loose. And when I say too loose, I mean very little or no planning at all. And we don't want something that is too tight that has no flexibility whatsoever. You want both planning and flexibility. So that means not just one plan with set steps, 
but a plan that is thoughtful with alternatives built in, with contingencies. It's a flexible approach, so you will never be stuck. You think in advance on what you are likely to encounter, and then you figure out in advance what the likely solution would be if you were to encounter that. So pre-plan those anticipated obstacles. And obstacles always occur. So in this plan, in this plan, it will occur as well, but at least you have flexible, flexibility built in. You've got alternative paths that you can pursue. So you take another path around the obstacle that you encounter. You continue on your way, perhaps you encounter more obstacles, in which case you repeat this process of the flexible approach until you are clear of all the obstacles, then you move on to successful completion. So eventually you, like a mountain stream, you flow around obstacles when you encounter them. You continue on your way, Eventually, you reach your destination. The green circle here, perhaps the destination for the mountain stream is a lake, perhaps it is the ocean, perhaps it is joining another stream to merge with that stream and continue flowing together. So whatever that is, you now have a graphical depiction of that process. So we are now ready to have an overall summary. I want to summarize both. My words have faces. My actions have principles. The summary is that Lao Tzu, his words are based on the Tao as the foundation. He's got basis. And his actions are based on the Tao as the guiding principle. So remember, we talked about direction, destination, the overall goal, milestones along the way. So these words and actions, they flow naturally from the Tao in a simple and straightforward way. What that means is that if you know the Tao, then you can, you can go directly to understanding his words and actions. Specifically, the words and actions of a Tao sage or Tao cultivators flow from the three treasures that Lao Tzu outlined. Those three treasures that we saw in the previous chapter, they were compassion, conservation, and humility or non-contention. And you can, you can describe them, you can talk about them in different ways. Compassion, you could describe that as kindness. Conservation, you could describe that as being frugal or being thrift, optimizing uh, economics. And humility, the way that Lao Tzu said it, was not daring to be foremost in the world. Humility also expressed as non-contention. So these can all be talked about in various different ways. The overall idea is the same. So this is also telling us that understanding the Tao should not be difficult because the Tao is one with nature. And you can also tell where do problems arise in understanding Lao Tzu. Problems in understanding his words and actions originate from a lack of understanding of the Tao itself. When you don't understand the Tao, you will also find what Lao Tzu says and does very puzzling. So the Tao itself, back in the days of Lao Tzu, was not well understood. Today, we have you know, the challenge of understanding ancient language. Back in those days, the language that it was written in, they did not consider that to be ancient language. It was modern to them. But the Tao was still not understood for a, the big reason. The number one reason is that people tended to focus on the material world to the exclusion of everything else. Now, it's the same today, back then, it was exactly like that as well. Ancient people were not especially spiritual compared to us. They had less technology, obviously, than we do, but in terms of human nature, they were the same. So 
we human beings today tend to be materialistic. Ancient people, people from ancient times, they were as well. That's the reason why they paid little attention to the formless Tao. We find the same to be true today. People today are not paying a whole bunch of, whole lot of attention to the Tao. And in ancient times, it was no different. So Lao Tzu looked at this reaction to the Tao, regarded the people with that fixation to the materialistic uh, things of the world. He saw this as ignorance. He saw this as self-delusion. So, as I said, not much has changed. We're the same. We're still fixated on the material world, just like people were in ancient times. Plus, we have, on top of all that, the language barrier. Now, you would think, because of our technology, uh, technological advances compared to ancient times, we have mass communication, mass media, we have the internet, you would think that the Tao would be better known because of that. Well, I think you can see that's probably not the case. The Tao remains relatively unknown. If you were to bring it up as a topic with your friends and family, you're gonna find that many people have not heard of the concepts that you describe. Some have no idea what you're talking about. And when we look at the teaching of the Tao in the West, well, much of it uh, is guesswork. Much of it is of a low quality because of the language barrier. Usually, oftentimes, Western writers would have a tendency to change the original to say what they think it means or what they think people want to hear. They want to appeal to the audience. And that's not necessarily what the original was trying to convey. So next we get to line six. So line six says, therefore they do not understand me. Lao Tzu says, well, people don't understand the Tao. They don't understand, they don't understand the words and actions have basis and central principle in the Tao. So of course they don't understand me. Let me break down this line. There are five characters in it. First two characters mean therefore, thus so. And then the third character means no. Fourth character means me, myself, and I. That's the character for I. And then the last character is no or understand. Now, if you string that together, you get, therefore, know me, understand, but what Ashley says is the translation, therefore, they do not understand me. We've got bookstores, but in bookstores, we have many Tao books with mistranslations. So we are not doing a better job than the ancients at understanding the Tao. In social media, we oftentimes encounter quotes from Lao Tzu or Quotes attributed to Lao Tzu. Well, these are misattributions. Oftentimes, people want to uh, create a quote and then assign it to a famous historical figure. So Confucius is one target, Lao Tzu is another one. So many of the quotes that we see on the internet are in fact not from Lao Tzu, but probably invented by someone much closer to the modern age. So unfortunately, the overall effect is people today understand Lao Tzu no better than in ancient times. Into this situation, you and I find ourselves. So our mission is to get to that better understanding. And to get to that better understanding, we need to understand the underlying foundation that Lao Tzu refers to when he started out talking about how people don't understand him. That is our task. That is what we're going to do. And there is a lot more that we, we can talk about to get us to that understanding. For now, I see that we are getting close to the top of the hour. So I want to jump to the summary. 
to kind of summarize what we have talked about today. The summary is going to be centered on what we just discussed, that the words of Laozi have basis. The actions of Laozi have principle. We want to be like the sages. We want to be like Laozi. Therefore, when it comes to words, when, we, when, when it comes to our communication with other people, here's what I would like to ask everyone. Think about your communication. Consider your words. And there are two things to consider. Number one is to speak the plain truth to avoid misleading half-truths. Number two is the question, are your words gentle and compassionate? Now, I specifically want to highlight these two because there are, I know there's going to be people who will say, what if the two bullet points here are at odds with one another? I want to speak the plain truth to my friend that he's out of shape, but my words are not going to be gentle to him. It's going to hurt his feelings. And many, many other uh, scenarios that are similar where speaking the truth may not be pleasant, may not be, may not be uh, something that people want to hear. But let me say that every situation has its own dynamics. In the scenario that I painted, your words may actually be quite compassionate. You are advising your friend about him being physically out of shape because that is the plain truth and you want him to be better. You want him to be better so he can stick around longer and continue to be your friend. So the Tao is not meant to be easy. There's going to be complexities in life that we navigate, but the principles themselves can be. The guiding principles can be simplicity itself. Then the skill is in utilizing the principles appropriately in life. It's the same with number two. Consider your actions. Here, I also have two bullet points. Is your intention centered in a Tao principle? Are you acting from the Tao? Are you trying to, for instance, bring about peace? Are you trying to diffuse a potentially explosive situation? So I would always be looking at the intention and then combining that with skillful actions that contribute to the common good. Is it something that will benefit yourself and other people? And oftentimes, the best actions in the DAO is something that benefits everyone. So we have an opportunity here to practice what we learn from Lao Tzu. Just as Lao Tzu watches his words and actions to make sure that they have a basis in the Tao, we can be doing the same thing. And that's going to get us further in the path of Tao cultivation. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us all travel safely so we can meet again. Until next time, may the Dell fill you with peace and happiness.